morning and welcome back to the Places Will Go show. Look, it's such a pleasure to have you back with, um, with us to begin what is probably going to be quite a whirlwind of a year, I suspect. Maybe, hopefully not quite like the last. So we think that hopefully the show can provide you with a little light entertainment, perhaps inspiration, but above all, realism as we hear from some amazing guests throughout this year. And I assure you, the lineup is absolutely fan flipping tastic You know we're here every Friday at 8 a.m. UK time. Now, you may, for all those who are coming and returning back to the show, you may notice something a little bit new and in that we've changed the name ever so slightly and updated our branding to really reflect more about what the show is about. You know, given the new year, we thought it's the right time for a little makeover. In addition, we're going to try something new. We want you to be even more engaged than you were last year. And we were thinking, based on audience feedback, that for the last 15 minutes, if you feel like you want to ask your question direct to the guest, um, just literally post your question in the question and answers. And Jordan will be in touch um, and to ask you if you want to then come on in the last 15 minutes on video or audio to ask our guest the question yourself. Now, look, before we get kicked off this morning with a fantastic guest, I just want to air something that's particularly close to our hearts at the School of Marketing. Now, we do realize that COVID has pretty much changed the course of many people's lives, bringing with it a huge amount of uncertainty and clearly ongoing uncertainty, um, which has brought the need to reskill and uptrain you know, even more to the forefront. But look, in particular, it's been really devastating on our young people and those at early stages in their careers, as many, many opportunities have literally just evaporated. And furthermore, you know, we can see what the future holds, right? An ongoing disruption to education, a mounting national debt problem, and really climbing unemployment. So the talk of a, a lost generation is really, truly and sadly here. So we want to do something about it. So this year, we are going to do something about it with a great ambition to actually kickstart the UK's largest mentoring initiative that directly helps the next generation, offering advice, guidance, and opportunities. So look, in the next few weeks, we are setting this up, and so we'll keep you all updated on progress. And in the meantime, if you know any young people who you think could benefit for such an opportunity, let them know it's coming down the track and we will definitely keep them updated about how to get involved. You know, as they say, action follows intent. So today we are announcing our intent to really try and tackle this major issue for so many, many young people. So look, on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Mark to introduce our guest today. Thank you, Richie, um, and happy new year, everyone. Well, in 2020, we were so privileged to have many, many great guests as we got the show off the ground, and many of you will have uh, hopefully enjoyed that. We saw time and again that very, very successful people actually had quite undulating journeys, um, but they probably learned most from their toughest times. And it was their resilience and bounce back ability, if you like, which defined them as much as their success. And so hopefully for many of you, seeing and hearing that helped you to find strength and energy in these very challenging times. Well, 2021, New Year, we intend to go even bigger and better. And frankly, what better way to kick off the year than with Keith Weed um, for our very first show of 2021. Um, so well, very welcome, Keith. I'm just going to flatter you a bit and then we'll get straight into it. So um, Keith is a, a, a stellar figure in marketing, the marketing world. There is no doubt about that. Uh, he had a very long and successful career at Unilever and spent nine years on the exec committee, which is some staying power in a big old organization like Unilever. And he retired as chief marketing communication and sustainability officer. So I'm not sure if that's CMCSO or CMO or CMCO. Keith will tell us more. But uh, um, I, I say retiring loosely because I think Keith actually goes from strength to strength. Um, I should, for one of the first things I should say is obviously Keith there was in the New Year's honor list, honors list uh, and is now CBE. I think I'm not sure if we have to refer to you as, as commander or not, but nonetheless, <laughs> I hear everyone crying, what took so bloody long? Um, but many congratulations for that. Uh, Keith's had a truly global impact in his career around sustainability in particular, uh, was at the heart of Unilever's sustainable living plan, which I think probably puts Unilever well ahead of the pack. Um, he's been instrumental in driving transparency and accountability in the big, for the big tech, and has does many, many pro bono roles. He's currently president of the Advertising Association, formerly president of the Marketing Society. 
it's for, it's for these reasons and actually many more that Keith was uh, Forbes' most influential CMO in the world, three years running, which I think is without precedent. The World Federation Associations, uh, World Federation of Advertisers, Global Marketer of the Year. So, as I said, it's a, it's a loose uh, reference to a retirement. Um, Keith is still doing so much more. Uh, he's non-exec for WPP and uh, Sainsbury, Sainsbury's, I think, president of the Royal Horticultural Society. I could go on. Keith has a wealth of experience, but perhaps above all, he's an all-round lovely guy. Uh, and oh. so I think you are going to get a lot. You can stop of there. <laughs> so so I, I, I'll um, I'll stop there. I could go on. I'll stop there. But Keith, it's wonderful to have you on just to kick off 2021. There isn't a better person we could have picked for this. And um, so I hand over to Richie and we'll get straight into the questions. But great to have you on, Keith. Well, Thank you very much, Mark. It was over generous as always. Hey, awesome. Well, look, Keith, um, let's, let's kick off. What's your New Year's resolutions? Oh, uh, New Year's resolution. Um, well, hopefully to have less lockdowns this year than I had last year. Um, but um, probably actually, I'd, I'd probably like to try and make a little bit more effort um, to reconnect with friends. Um, I'm, a, I'm an extrovert by uh, by nature. And I personally find these lockdowns and dare I say lack of meetings. I never thought I used to like meetings, but now I realise I actually quite liked meetings. Uh, I found that quite um quite frustrating. So uh, I know we all got in the early days of the first lockdown, got into Zoom drinks and things like that. Um, but uh, I think I'm going to make a, a little bit more of a structured approach to reconnect because, um, yeah, I've become a little hermit-like. I mean, obviously using uh, the Zoom to connect with people. But uh, um, yeah, I think a bit, a bit more connection with friends and, uh, and, and sort of rebalance the... I, I use Zoom a lot for work, um, but I think I should try and find ways to use it more socially. I'm yeah, not. so it's, it's it's looking like it's going to be a tough year, and this hermit thing is a is a, is a big deal. I mean, how how do you you know, do you find it affects your sort of energy or how you get yourself up for for important things? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I suppose, you know, different people uh, are are motivated or stimulated in in different ways. Um, I, I must admit, I, I'm a little bit of a vampire um, on people, um, so I I get energy from others, and and, and when I'm with other people. Um, I, you know, I see ideas and thoughts and I bounce off them, etc. Um, so for me personally, you know, locking me in my study as I am right now is, is close to torture. Um, so um, uh, you're, you're right. It, it's, it, it's, I've had to think differently because um, I haven't had the same connection. Um, and I'm quite lucky that you know, in, the t in the breaks between lockdowns, I have multiple different offices I, I can go to. And interestingly, the, the two boards, the uh, two PLC boards I'm on, had different approaches. So Sainsbury's, uh, you know, we, we've never met uh, uh, for a board or an AGM or whatever. We've done all of it online. But for WPP, for example, we do get together uh, for board meetings. We arrive in the morning. We all line up and have our COVID tests every morning. Uh, there's a doctor there that gives them. You go into a waiting room until your result comes out. And then you go up to this massive room where uh, your social distancing around the table is much more than six foot. Uh, but uh, we've all had tests and then we're all separated. But I found that actually much more engaging than, um, than trying to continually Zoom. So, uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I sort of bounce off people better than, than, um, than uh, computer screens. So. I tell you, what, a, what, a, what a, a way to enter a boardroom meeting, huh? medical tests. Is that, is that the future, huh? But, uh, but look, Keith, I'd um, love to get the inside scoop. I mean, you literally ran what is, you know, the largest FMCG company in the world. Inside scoop. Tell us a little bit about that. What were some of the highest, lowest challenges? And perhaps reflecting on your career, some of those. Give us some of those insights. Oh, wow. Big question. Um, so I suppose what's, what I enjoyed about Unilever is... Um, the, the willingness uh, for Unilever to, to really think about sort of a multi-stakeholder approach. So one of the, the things I was keen to do when I became uh, the CMO uh, was to try and think about the role of, of business in society. And I, I was very lucky to work with a group of people uh, who had, had similar ambitions. And maybe that's, maybe that's one of my learnings, actually. You can only really make the sort of scale of impact I think Unilever has and continues to make if there are enough people lined up at the top of the business who share a similar vision. So my boss, Paul Polman, was passionate about reinventing business and putting sustainability at its core. Um, our chief supply chain officer, uh, Pierluigi Sigamondi, I, I couldn't have achieved half what we did in, uh, in moving to, to more sustainable sourcing without his connection as well. Uh, and I think 
that lineup was part of it. But the ambition to say, could we find um, a, a different business model that had sustainability core? In fact, the idea when Paul first approached me and said, you know, I want you to be the chief marketing officer, but I also want you to be the chief sustainability officer, you know, pull the two together. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't see how you'd square that one. And then he said, and also run communications because you know, with the internet, the world's going to be much more joined up and we can't have communications officer over here and marketing over there. Um, and it seemed like a curious job, um, of which actually initially I refused. I said, no, no. at the time I was running you know, our global home care, laundry and home care business, which was a 8 billion euro business. And I thought, well, no, 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 I'm going to keep, keep, with, keep with the P&L. Um, but um, in his usual charm, he charmed me around. And thank God he did, because that nine years was the, the best fun. I think I actually ultimately had the best job uh, in Unilever. I had uh, all the ability to innovate without all the uh, responsibilities of a CEO uh, uh, Paul had to uh, deal with. Uh, and, and I thought the thought that um, how could we champion uh, brands with purpose, brands with meaning, um, brands that matter, whatever term you want to use. And I know a lot of people feel that, oh my God, we've been talking about this so long. Uh, I think we're just starting. I think we're the foothills of this. And if you think about how businesses were at the beginning, business succeeded by uh, supporting the society around them. Um, and uh, if I go back to the beginning of Unilever with Lord Leverhulme, uh, he saw the dirt and squalor of Victorian England and wanted to take cleanliness to the masses. And this was before you know, EY and McKinsey and purpose statements. Uh, he actually had a purpose statement. He, he wanted to make cleanliness commonplace, cleanliness commonplace. He wanted to take cleaning to the masses and he launched Sunlight Soap. He, he built the, the biggest private port in the world in Port Sunlight and started shipping uh, soap around the world. And to this day, Unilever is still the world's biggest soap company. So he certainly achieved uh, that objective. But the thought of how he could serve a society, and I think what happened to marketing in the uh, 70s and 80s, and I'd say even the 90s, is, is we sort of got a little bit lost into selling more stuff. Um, and uh, I was keen to try and make marketing noble again, to try and put the consumer, the customer, at the centre of our business and say, you know, how can we really help people um, who don't know how to wash their hands properly, you know, wash their hands properly? And, and uh, you know, with, with Lifebuoy principally around the world, we've taught over a million people how to wash their hands properly and, and many more to go or, or, or brush your teeth properly. And uh, I know these are basic things uh, which we take for granted uh, in, in sort of Europe and, and, uh, uh, and North America, but these are still big challenges um, uh, for uh, people's quality of life. And, and dare I say, quality of life of, of, uh, in, the, in the UK or, or Europe of, of having you know, good washing powders or, or liquids, whatever. So you know, Unilever is an everyday uh, consumer goods product. Uh, Every day, two and a half billion people uh, use these products. And what I enjoyed was the curiosity of understanding people's lifestyles and how, how we could serve them better, as simple as that. So Keith, uh, uh, such a great ambition to, to talk about making marketing more noble and, and to find a different way of business. I, I think actually what defines you in many ways is you, you're very ambitious, very ambitious for yourself, but also for your people, for your company, for your industry, but, but doing things in the right way, which is a great combination. Now, do you think that's was always there from when you were a child and growing up into adulthood or something that grew up as you talked about uh, changes in society? You know, wh where did that come from? that sort of balance between ambition, but doing things the right way? Um, oh, uh, gosh. Um, well, I suppose that you do things the right way. I suppose I had, had quite a, uh, uh, my parents were quite uh, moral um, and um, uh, they were sort of quite, you know, driven in, in you know, wanting, uh, encouraging me to be uh, a, a sort of success, I suppose. So I suppose a, a nurturing uh, background in, in, in that way. Um, uh, and um, uh, and then I suppose um, you know, over over a period of time is um, I suppose realizing that a lot of stuff is made up. Um, I think um, we have a lot of um, sort of barriers put in place um, by well-meaning people, um, and um, and whether it be your siblings, your teachers, uh, your parents, um, there are sort of um, self-limiting beliefs that uh, are, are, are fed into us. And, um, and where I, st I started, I suppose, early on is, is just 
testing some of those. Um, of course, the, it's not all true. I mean, you know, a belief that I, that I can't fly, that is a true one. So I don't think I should test that one by jumping off the top of a, bil- a building. But I started trying to work out, you know, what, is, what really is a, a belief or not. And I, I actually, I, I, was, I had a, a massive lesson in that, I suppose, in my, um, when was it? Uh, uh, mid thirties, um, uh, when I w- moved to France um, uh, from America, I'd been in, in the US for five years working for Unilever, um, and I, I wanted to go to Paris again, rather stupidly, uh, because I liked the idea of going to Paris. And Unilever very kindly sent me there, stupidly, because I failed my French O level or French GCSE, as they're now called. Um, so I couldn't speak French at all, at all, at all. Um, and the one thing you realise if you work for a French business, um, they, they want you to speak French. Um, and, um, uh, and so one of my self limiting beliefs, which is put into you in the UK, is you're either a scientist or a linguist. And you know, the two never cross. And I did maths, physics, chemistry, and um, I studied engineering. So you know, I was very much in the analytical side. And so by definition, I couldn't speak languages. Um, but um, over the next uh, six months, um, I learned to speak French. And by the way, if I can learn to speak French, anyone can learn to speak French um, and uh, end up working in French uh, as well. So uh, I suppose one of the things is, is just you know, push out and, and test uh, uh, the, the parameters. And um, you know, that good old line, you know, if, if, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. I, I think beginning to accept that mucking up is is part of of of, uh, of learning and um, you know that 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 well overused Edison quote about sort of you know, you know he didn't fail about trying to get the the um, uh, the, the light bulb but he was learning a, another way uh, how it didn't work um, and hence you know kept pushing himself to how he found it did work and of course he he did make it work so I know that's easy to say uh, with hindsight and by God, I've had some some big failures on the way, but you do learn more from from your mistakes. Keith, I, I, your last sentence there, big failures along the way. Tell us tell us what, what perhaps is one or two of the biggest things that... that <laughs> oh God, I shouldn't have said that. No, big successes on the way. Let, let's talk about the successes. <laughs> <laughs> no, go on, one or two. What what some of the ones that... The, big, the biggest lessons you've learned? Um, I don't know. I suppose... Um, well, look, in the, uh, where were we? Must have been early 2000s, 20 years ago. Uh, take yourself back 20 years and, um, and think about Gillette, uh, uh, which was, um, uh, uh, still is, you know, the world's leading razor business. But back then, Gillette had a, a positioning which was very much focused on sort of um, a young, young dad, uh, you know, Gillette, uh, the best the man can get. Um, uh, they were then still pr- uh, primarily a, a, a two-way uh, blade razor. They just launched Mac three, a three-blade uh, razor, um, and um, a, a very big, profitable business. Um, and I was running uh, in the UK, um, Unilever's business, uh, and also the innovation centre for uh, male toiletries and deodorants brands, of which the the, the real uh, leader at the time, without question, was in the UK Lynx. Uh, or acts as it's called around the world. Um, and um, uh, to give you an idea, in the UK, 60% of adolescent guys use Lynx uh, or Axe. So it was a monster of a brand and, and anything it did at the time, 20 years ago, uh, you couldn't touch it. Uh, and so I, quite sensibly, we were looking at line extensions and, um, and, and the design of razors were quite plonky as well in there. I thought, well, hold on, if we came up with a really sexy looking uh, razor, and we positioned it for young uh, men and, and adolescent uh, guys. Um, all I needed was 5% of the razor market for it to be an absolute runaway success. Um, and, um, uh, and how could we do that? And then, you know, looking around the world, uh, managed to find Kai, uh, which is a, a Japanese um, uh, knife and, and blade manufacturer, who actually, I, I believe, actually even invented the three-blade razor and had a patent for the three-blade razor in Japan. So um, I persuaded them to make a really uh, trendy looking razor, three blade, uh, and we tested it in the UK and it, and it beat the sensor and all the other razors from, uh, from Gillette. It didn't beat the, the Mac 3, but Mac 3 was, I think then, just less than 10% of the market. So not a big issue. We're going off to 90% of the market. I only need 5% share. This was going to be like, you know, taking sweets off children. Um, and um, so we geared up, had some great advertising. Thank you very much, BBH. 
um, and um, uh, then we launched sort of big scale the Lynx uh, Razor. Um, now, in parallel, of course, with the build up the launch, uh, what I didn't know was uh, Gillette um, was speaking to Gillette HQ in, in Boston. Um, and basically they were given the brief is make this fail at any cost. Um, I let, later on spoke to the guy who was running in the UK um, after all this. Um, and he told me this because what they'd learned uh, looking at, at you know, acts around the world is if we were a success in the UK and Unilever rolled this razor across the world, the cost to Gillette was huge. And what Gillette had to do was buy some time to, to, to make their, their image younger um, and also to, to sort of revamp their, their packaging and design. And so basically what they did is they dropped Mac 3 from a very high height uh, on all the consumers in the UK. And to this day, by the way, the most developed Mac 3 market in the world is the UK. Um, they just took out every single user uh, in um, and... Um, my, my launch of uh, Lynx Razors was the most death, deathly launch you've ever imagined. I had gondola ends, etc. It just sat there. Um, in fact, when I retired from Unilever um, last year, uh, one of the, uh, the year before, sorry, one of the, one of the jokes that um, uh, were said is there are still warehouses in the UK full of Lynx Razors. Um, it never went anywhere. It died. It just died and died and died. Um, and we withdrew it a few months later at tremendous cost. But the lesson I learned um, is Max 3 was actually better than the Lynx triple blade razor because the triple blade was designed for uh, Japanese stubble, uh, which is a different, different type of stubble than Caucasian stubble. And so although it is great versus a two blade razor, it wasn't as good as a three blade. So if you're going to take on an entrenched competitor, make sure you have a superior product because if not, they will leverage their, their brand equity, uh, their operational excellence and strength and push that product advantage um, you know, to their consumers and down your throat. Um, and, uh, and we were basically beaten by a better product. We deserve to lose. Um, but I only needed 5%. I didn't get anywhere. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great lesson. And, and uh, to be honest, who'd have thought that different stubble was, uh, you know, stubble was different around the world. J just, just to pick up on um, ethnicity as a, as a topic, um, we haven't even mentioned it so far, but the un Unstereotype Alliance, also your baby, uh, many people will perhaps won't know much about that. So maybe, Keith, you could just give us a bit of the, the why and the what of the Unstereotype Alliance. Well, the Unstereotype Alliance is basically reflecting the power that advertising has. So advertising um, has a big role in our culture, has a big role in engaging people, um, and people spend a lot of time uh, being uh, um, uh, connecting and being uh, shown advertising. So uh, against that, I think we have a responsibility in the way uh, we use advertising. Now, of course, uh, you know, we do, there are lots of things that we can do um, like bombardment or bad use of data, et cetera. But one thing that I, I believe the role of advertising can do is also model um, uh, you know, the right things that we would like to see and not um, magnify or amplify the wrong things. And back in 2016, uh, I was still at Unilever then, so that's four years ago, we started this exercise in looking across six key markets, developed and, and developing markets, uh, and looking at the uh, advertising, not just our advertising, but across the board, uh, and found out that 40% of women did not identify um, themselves in ads. 40%. Now, these are ads that are meant to be engaging, connecting. Um, and then on top of that, when we analyzed the ads, we found that only 3% of the ads uh, were, were women uh, obviously um, intelligent, depicted as being obviously intelligent, 2% uh, uh, of the ads in, in leadership positions, and 1% of the ads depicted with a sense of humour. And I don't know about you, that doesn't reflect any woman I know. So somehow advertising has got locked into a, like a 1950s stereotype of sort of dad in the garage, um, uh, not being able to use the, the washing machine, uh, mum in the kitchen lovingly cooking and with a smile on her face. And, and so we started unstereotyping our, our advertising in Unilever. But then I realised that we wouldn't make the progress we needed unless we tried to take the industry with us because we needed advertising agencies and creatives to, to help and share that vision. So in 2017 at Cannes, um, uh, I'd approached UN Women, United Nations Women, and asked them to take over. We gifted them the, the trademark and, and uh, the property of, of Unstereotype Alliance and asked them to lead it because there was no way 
we were going to get competitors and all advertisers uh, engaged in this. And, and actually the meeting at the Can Lion, you know, the big advertising festival in 2017, we had you know, all the heads of the big uh, agencies from, you know, from publicists and Omnicom and WPP and Interpublic. Uh, we had you know, Facebook and Google. We had the major advertisers. It's one of the few meetings where I invited Mark Pritchard, the CMO of P&G. Uh, as you know, P&G and Unilever aren't the best friends. Uh, and he came. So uh, Mark Pritchard was there. I was there. Uh, you know, Diageo. Uh, you can imagine uh, the, the breadth of, of people. And then also sort of the um, uh, ANA and the 4As and the advertising associations and, uh, and uh, ISBAR and, and IPX. So uh, it was a truly tremendous meeting. Um, and, and then since then, we've been... Uh, building this um, uh, uh, with with measures of understanding how people uh, um, uh, decode advertising, and we're all committed to unstereotyping advertising around the world. And now there are national chapters being launched. And during lockdown last year, uh, I launched the UK national uh, chapter. So there's uh, people online in the UK who are interested. Uh, please uh, connect with me uh, on, on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, and I would love you to, to come on board. Uh, there's a small fee, I should uh, um, say, because uh, obviously UN women have to uh, drive the, uh, the, uh, uh, the whole administration and support behind this. But we have over 30 companies now in the UK, stretching from sort of Tesco's and Sainsbury's and the co-op on one side uh, through to you know, Unilever and Diageo um, and B&Q on the other. Um, and... You know, the more brands and more agencies that come on board, uh, the better, because we've still got work to do. We've, we've made progress, but we've still got work to do. And, and now, of course, we've broadened it. And actually, our, uh, in the UK, we've said that our, our initial priority and, fo uh, and focus is going to be around women of colour. So we're going to take the intersectionality um, uh, on, on both um, uh, ethnic and uh, gender and focus on that first. Keith, wow, what a lovely example of a, such a super partnership. And actually, the, the strategy around gaining traction was actually perhaps the gem in that lesson there around letting go of the baby in order to make it a bigger movement. I think that's quite genius in many ways. Um, Keith, you know, in 2020, you gave me some rock star advice about what we should be doing at, at School of Marketing, which really tremendously helped. Um, a lot of people out there now, similar spots, whether they're in the corporate land, entrepreneurs, people looking to get into the to, to careers in 2021. Um, what type of advice would you give them um, at this point and perhaps reflecting on how you think 2021 is going to be, um, you know, moving forward? And then we're going to get into some questions from the audience. Great. Um, well, look, I think some uh, um, huge things changed in, in 2020. And we often talk in, in marketing about change and uh, and you know, an adaption, etc. But we also know that actually things move incredibly slowly. We're all creatures of habit. Um, and despite people saying, I mean, how, how many times was it the year of mobile um, over the last uh, 10 years? I mean, clearly now mobile has arrived, but I can remember the year of mobile. And then it, it was the year of voice. And you know, every year was going to be the year of voice. Uh, and and you know, consumers change slowly. And of course, marketers have to be ahead of consumers. We need to be um, we need to get to the future first and welcome consumers uh, as they arrive. But what happened in 2020? Things changed really quickly uh, and, and at real scale. And um, we can pull out different things, but I'd like to pull out two, because two where I think marketers are still behind the consumer and we need to run to catch up. So the first is, is the way people were engaging with content. And of course, here we all are looking uh, at a screen uh, right now, um, live streaming content much more than before, but content generally, and the need for brands and marketers to generate a lot more content. Uh, and um, you know, that great sort of adage that you can have it um, you know, good, um, cheap, or quick, you know, choose two of the three. Uh, and how do you do, do all three? How do you get good quality, um, have something that's uh, um, uh, you know, uh, good value um, and also do it quickly. Uh, and there are, you know, again, there are lots of innovative companies out there like, like Tribe, if you haven't seen uh, Tribe, who are using user-generated content to give you high quality stuff quickly um, and, and lots of it uh, as well. So you know, I think as marketers, the great thing about digital and innovation is there are solutions to our problems, but producing lots of high quality content um, I think 
is still falling short. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, which connects me to my next one around e-commerce, a lot of you shop online and look at some of the content that brands are doing online. It's as if like we do a Rolls Royce execution on TV. We do a sort of maybe a, a BMW and Mercedes execution on social. But by the time you get down to e-commerce, um, you know, we're not we're not even at. Well, I won't say because I don't want to offend one of the car brands, but yeah, we're pretty, pretty at the very bottom of the scale. So I, I think um, uh, content and producing content um, and engaging with, with consumers is something that we saw a major shift in 2020, and that's going to gather pace in 2021. And are you and your brand producing the quality of content you're proud of? Stand back and look at what you're producing. I think too often as marketers, we push content out and we don't run around the other side and see what's arriving. You know, one of the first things I used to do uh, at Unilever when I visited the country was actually you know, do a, sort of an audit on what the consumers were seeing. And of course, a lot of the local marketers didn't even see what the consumers were seeing because it was a piecemeal of stuff coming in from the global marketers and different people doing different things. And we don't piece together the jigsaw. So do an audit on the content, quality of content, and your engagement on that. And what are your, your consumers, your customers are really uh, interested in. And the second thing is e-commerce. So we've seen a massive step change. We all know that. But have we really step changed as brand marketers and brand manufacturers uh, to, to, to really embrace uh, and get ahead of consumers? And I would say no. I think the channels have. I think if you look at what Amazon's done, uh, 10 out of 10. Uh, if I look, you know, I'm on the board of, of Sainsbury's. We just gave our results yesterday, which uh, were very good in case anyone missed them. Um, but our growth on e-commerce, 126%. So you know, we had a 7.4% 7, 7 growth on grocery, um, bricks and mortar, but you know, a massive uh, growth on, on e-commerce. And if I look at what manufacturers are doing, no, 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 not good enough, not good enough. And I know things are changing and we're all trying to change quickly, but really look at the way you engage with retailers on e-commerce and look at the way you serve um, our customers. And I, I think that's the sort of, uh, to me, well, to the chat, and I'll throw two in very quickly for free, uh, Brands With Purpose, Look at the growth of brands that have been really authentic, that have really helped serve society uh, through last year, um, and, and uh, hopefully encourage you to, to find what's the purpose of your brand. You know, I think now is the time where people are looking for brands to serve society. You can't have a healthy business in an unhealthy uh, society. And, and you know, how can we really find ways of, of serving society? Uh, and, and attached to that is sustainability. I think environmental and social sustainability is really mainstreaming now. So again, if you're not really addressing um, your impact on plastic waste uh, or indeed your carbon footprint, uh, start now. And it, you, know, you could say, well, hold on, all these companies, are, you know, Patagonia, they're too far ahead. It's never too late. You know, that great African proverb, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago or today. Don't put it off. Plant your tree today. You can start now because you will still get ahead of all those other companies who are going to be behind you. So that was to answer your question about what I think is going to happen in 2021, 20. Now, what was your other part of the question? Because I've now forgotten it. So, Richie, shall we, um, I'm just uh... And what I'm going to do, Keith, actually, is before we jump to the uh, general Q&A from others, yeah. uh, one last question. It has two parts. Um, it's, it's a short question to ask, but it's hopefully uh, me quite meaningful. Your, your biggest regret and your proudest achievement? Um, biggest regret is, and this is a, sounds like a mean one, but biggest regret is not removing uh, um, people um, who weren't right for the team who are underperforming quick enough. Um, if for every time I, I start a new role uh, with people, whatever, you and your gut know quite quickly who are the people who are the right people on the bus uh, and not. And, and um, I remember visiting Southwest Airlines um, and Southwest Airlines are good, to, they're known well for their culture. And they had this expression called the turd in the pool. Um, and the turd in the pool, not very nice expression, is it? The turd in the pool idea is this, is it only takes one turd in the swimming pool and no one wants to get in and swim. Um, and, you know, there are some people who come into the room and suck the very oxygen out of the air. 
and all possibilities and opportunities go out there and people get very defensive and they're worrying about what is their market share in in co-op in Birmingham or Walmart in Alabama or whatever, uh, rather than thinking about, you know, how do we take this business forward? Um, and, and you need to get you need to get the right people on the bus. Uh, and the quicker you do it, the quicker you'll be successful. So my regret is, is too often it took me too long to act on people who I knew really weren't, weren't right. Um, and also for them as well, they need to get on to their careers and do a job that would suit them because the one they were doing clearly wasn't suiting them. Um, and so you're actually helping them as well, um, even though it, it doesn't sound it. Uh, that was the, the, the regret. And what's the other question? Proud achievement. Proud achievement. Um, well, it'd be easy to say uh, Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Um, I uh, named it and launched it and, and worked with uh, lots of uh, other people on that and a great team at Unilever. But probably it was turning around uh, the laundry and home care business in Unilever. Um, I took it on uh, in uh, um, uh, a, a time when laundry was declining, household care, you know, SIF, domestos, et cetera, were declining. Uh, Unilever had lost hope in it. This was before I was on the executive. And I can remember Patrick Sesco, the CEO of Unilever, saying, if you can turn this around, this will be the making of you. Um, and six months later, I was completely and utterly distraught. Uh, it wasn't turning around. Uh, I, I felt that it wouldn't turn around. I took on something too big. Uh, I had failed. I can remember telling my wife I was going to lose my job. Um, I needed to find another job, uh, etc. Um, you know, we're going to have to move the kids into a different school. Uh, all those conversations. Um, uh, but then I just focused um, on the basics of get the product better, get the communication engaging with people and build brands take on some fights, uh, you know, P&G had lost, so P&G had won, Unilever had lost, how do we get back on the front foot? Um, and um, I'm glad to say that I was more successful in turning around the laundry and home care business than I was in finding a new job. Um, and uh, the business, when I left it, um, what, 15 years ago, was the fastest growing business in Unilever. And 15 years later, it is still the fastest growing business in Unilever. So sustained uh, turnaround. And it was a great bunch of people. We were really sort of battle hardened um, and um, we, we, we grew share um, and for a period of time, um, we were very much in, in winning ways from, from uh, yeah, we went from avoiding losing to playing to win uh, and, and we won. And, and for all the people involved in that, there were many, many people. It was uh, marvelous because our mindset went from complete doom and gloom to yes, yes, we can, we can do this. You know, Keith, you know what you just said there, um, going from avoiding losing to playing to win, flip and hang. Now that should be the, the mantra of 2021, right? We need to literally get back on it. But what a lovely legacy to, to lead and to, and to think about. Um, so, you know, just absolutely fabulous there. Look, we're, we're, gonna, we're running out of time here. Loads of questions. We're probably going to run a, a couple of minutes over because I want to get to the questions. Before I do that, I just want to have a few shout outs to a couple of our most loyal community, um, people who come on each and week. So Agatha, love to see you back. Barney, love to see you again um, on, on the show. Um, we've got uh, Gary, Hina, Jess, um, John, um, Kaj, uh, Kajia, um, Keith, um, we've got Lucy, so many people who come on week on week, uh, Matt, Richard, Sophie, lovely to see you on, um, Rod, um, lovely to see you on, I think, for the first time as a guest, as opposed to um, um, uh, uh, coming on the show yourself, Phil, Raju, look, so many people to call out, um, Saffron, again, um, Sam as well. So look, I'm going to get to some questions, Keith, let's try and be um, a rapid fire round on these, because there's just too many to keep on going. So First one from Raju, um, given the, the paradigm shift in the consumer space and the presence of small parity brands in the fray and the onset of digital touch points, how do large brands get to reinforce and sustain their brand story in an empathetic way? Yeah, hey, great, um, great question. Of course, uh, we, what's happened with both uh, uh, digital and e-commerce is the, the big barriers to entry to enter a lot of these markets have, have collapsed. You can you can enter on a small social media budget and and, and e-commerce directly. Um, hey, the big the big brands are going to have to have to learn to dance. Um, and certainly in Unilever, we launched uh, a lot of uh, small brands and also started to learn uh, to to engage in, in, in the, the way. So, I mean, uh, learn from what's around you. And I, I did a lot around working with startups um, to try and learn from them. 
uh, Unilever Ventures investing in startups as well to, to learn. So I think the big brands need to learn. But let's remember, despite all this change, you know, what makes a, a brand successful? It's real consumer insight. It's understanding your consumer better than uh, the alternative, your competitors, and then providing them with a service or a product better than your competitors. Marketing is as simple as that. And if you can do that at scale, you, you'll win. And you need to find ways of, of, of building your brand with scale. And you know, when big brands complain about the difficulty of small brands, you know, if I had a choice of having a big business or a small business, most of us would choose a big business. So I think you know, take your size, but don't squander it. You know, use that to really build uh, awareness and engagement. And if you've, if you've read um, how brands grow, um, I think that idea of mental availability and physical availability is, is a really great way of thinking about it. And big brands have to do it as much as small brands. So Keith, um, next question from Ruben. Thanks, Ruben. Uh, what is your own purpose and has it evolved over time? Um, yeah, I think it has. Um, so you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm a great sort of uh, believer in um, trying to sort of help, help people at scale. Um, I, I think all of us have a tremendous uh, feeling to, to help others. Um, and, um, and with that, of course, initially be your, your, your family and your children, which is very natural. But, you know, how can then you, uh, um, you know, help, help others? And one thing I, I learned at Unilever, I had the opportunity to do that at scale. I think it's, it's relatively easy to do things um, when you've got your hands on all the levers. What's much more difficult is to do things when you have 5,000 marketers in 190 countries. Um, and, um, and the scale bit was the bit that I felt that maybe uniquely I could tap into uh, and leverage. So uh, that thought of, of how can you make people's lives that little bit better, a little bit easier. And I know it sounds bizarre when you're talking about shampoo and soap, et cetera, but you know, tomorrow morning, get up, don't have a shower, don't brush your teeth, put on dirty clothes, eat off a dirty plate, and then go and have a good day. You know, they're, they're, small, they're small products, but they have big self-esteem uh, impact. So I think helping people, but at scale. Um, I am conscious of time, but there, there are so many good questions. We didn't quite get to the bring people in, um, but, but nonetheless, uh, perhaps last question, we'll see. But from Katie, great question, Katie. How do we make sure sustainability doesn't take a back step in business priorities as we are predicted to head into a double dip recession? Well, yeah, I, I think it's a very good question. And of course, it, it, everything will be will be rattled. Uh, the first things that people do is, is grab the, uh, the P&L. Um, I think where we have to do is uh, make sustainability part of the everyday business uh, and also um, make it part of the brand. Um, and if it's an add-on, um, then of course it will be cut. And that's one of the reasons actually, funny enough, when I took over my role uh, at Unilever, um, the first thing I did is I actually closed down the CSR department. I closed down the corporate social responsibility department. I got a lot of criticism for it. Uh, but my argument at the time, which I think sort of then worked, was it was because I wanted to mainstream sustainability. I wanted to make it everyone's job. Not those people over there, they do it so the rest of us can carry on business as usual because they negate the bad stuff we do. So my, my uh, advice to, to a marketer is, is don't let the sustainability department or the CSR department own this. No, 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 you own it. This is part of your proposition. You want to own uh, how your brand and how, how your business is, is, is uh, projected to your consumers. So take the agenda on. I, I think sustainability department should be run by, by marketers, by the marketing department as part of the brand. And if you can you know, help uh, your business see that, then I, I don't think we'll take a back seat. I, I'm sure it will take a little bit of a, a sidestep, but it certainly doesn't need to take a back seat. Yeah, no, no great insights as ever, Keith. I mean, it's, it's uh, the miracle of time. Is, uh, it's disappeared uh, in a flash and we've got a ton more questions. But, but we are out of time. Um, and, and so what remains, I think Richie's back, but what remains is to say a, a massive thank you before I um, hand to Richie to talk to next week. Uh, a, a, few, a few quick reflections. Um, as Richie pulled out, the thought of playing to win, what a great thought into this year. Um, so easy to be inertiated. And I love the sort of activism and energy around that. Uh, I'll never forget the turd in the pool. Um, that's a keeper. <laughs> Uh, but but your more your big message around sustainability, authenticity, what's right, what's fair, what's true, what's proper, 
Um, uh, but perhaps most of all, where we started, I just love what you've talked about, challenging your own self-limiting beliefs. And um, we are all cursed with uh, imposter syndrome, ap apart from the sociopaths, apparently they get away with it, but we all have some self-limiting beliefs. So that's a, that's a great message that I'll bring right back to the fore that we started on at the beginning of the interview. But Keith, it's been a wonderful 45 minutes or so. Thank you so much again for joining us on behalf of everybody here. Um, so thank you again. Have a great 2021. I'm sure you will. And I'll just hand to Richie to say a few final closing words. But thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. Keith, it's just been an absolute pleasure. And I, I just love the, the passion and energy with which you're going to be tackling 2021. Some of those stories of vulnerability, some of those stories of absolute failure. Um, clearly, I don't use razors. So, you know, um, but, but that one will certainly stick with you, I'm sure, for a lifetime. But, There's uh, a warehouse full of them somewhere. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope maybe I can get a free shipment of some. But look, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on and I look forward to continuing the relationship over to 2021. Great. Well, thank you very much for the time and thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, you're right, the time just flew by. Um, and uh, if there are other questions out there, I'm sure we'll try and get to them some, uh, some other way. Very good. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Uh, Rich, you just going to say a, a quick word on next week? Well, absolutely. Well, we've got a great guest lined up for next week, Ollie Barrett, who is absolutely a superstar. Great guy. Oh, you've got to when come back next week. To... He's absolutely brilliant. You're absolutely bang on. Um, so, yes, look forward to that um, next week. So do tune in. Cheers, everybody. Have a great weekend. Cheerio.